So that's our next speaker, Thomas Bosnar, and he will talk about what is a Riemann Hilbert problem. Many thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. Um, this, um, I, I'm sorry upfront for not being with you in person. It's a few days from now, I'm hosting my own conference here in Bristol and, and it's hard to be in, in these two different places at the same time. But nevertheless, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to contribute at least virtually to uh, the exciting summer workshop that is, you know, just started. Now, what I've prepared is very much a survey talk. It is intended for newcomers to the field, not for experts. And I'm simply trying to answer the question as on the slide, what is a Riemann-Hilbert problem? So I, what I will do is I will take you on a little historic excursion, trying to first pin down the what I would call first occurrence of a Riemann-Hilbert problem in mathematics. Then I will tell you what kind of work was done back then on the same problem. And then we will see that very naturally out of this work, a beautiful analytical apparatus grew, which nowadays can be summarized under sort of an umbrella of Riemann-Hilbert techniques. And then I will showcase that same bag of you know, techniques with five examples. They are all coming from the theory of integrable systems, very much aligning with the topics, with the focus points on this workshop. That's more or less the idea. If there's any questions whatsoever along the way, just, you know, in, stop me and, and let's chat about the questions. All right. All right. So to begin, um, if you are an expert in this field, and of course, many of those are in the room, um, the answer you probably know, but if not, then perhaps my answer to the question, what is a Riemann-Hilbert problem is not what you might think. In fact, one can make a point, and this point has been made, that the first Riemann-Hilbert problem occurred 125 years ago in 1900. This was the Second International Congress of Mathematics, famously held at Paris, and Hilbert, during one of the sessions, he gave his address, and he came up with a list of problems for the 21st century. 23 of those Many of those very famous problems, very hard problems, we'll be interested in problem number 21. So Hilbert did a curious thing. He first published his problem list in German, not in the French, not in the French proceedings of the uh, Congress. And this here is copy paste from his German publication. So I will translate. This is problem number 21. It's about proof of existence of linear differential equations with prescribed monodromy group. Now, now, the terminology already appeared in, in the previous talk, right? Uh, monodromy appeared there. But if you're a newcomer, I, I will define it later on precisely. All right. Before doing that, let's read on a little bit what he says here. So he says, well, it's a problem in the theory of linear differential equations. He says or he claims that this problem is probably something that Riemann already thought about. And the problem consists in showing that there is always a linear differential equation of the Fuchsian class with prescribed singular points and prescribed monodromy group, okay? More to the point, he says the question or the tasks asks us to find n functions in the variable z. Those functions are, well, regular complex analytic in the complex z plane away from the singular points. In those singular points, the function can become infinite of only finite order. And as you continue the function you know, along a loop around the singularity, it changes via the given monodromy. Right? One can make a point that this is really the very first Riemann-Hilbert problem. Why? Well, because Hilbert formulated and he well clearly mentions Riemann up here. Although, if you're honest, I don't think you can find any papers of Riemann where he actually thinks about, you know, a problem of this type. But nevertheless, I will follow this convention. This is also a convention that was pinned down by Anosov and Bolibruch. Andrei Bolibruch is a player that will appear frequently in the first half of my talk. They wrote a nice book about Hilbert's 21st problem and also follow the logic that we should call it the original Riemann-Hilbert problem. It is definitely a problem in the space of Riemann's ideas because Hilbert asks us to construct, well, a function globally from given local data, right? So this, this is definitely a theme uh, very much present in Riemann's work on complex analysis. 
All right, so that's the original Riemann-Hilbert problem, Hilbert's 21st problem. Now, 125 years have passed since then, so it's only natural to ask whether it has been solved. And there, a curious thing seemingly happened. If you look up, this is from Wikipedia, 21st problem, the answer is, well, partially resolved. Even better, you can choose your answer. Yes, no, open, depending on more exact formulations of the problem. So that something very curious happened. Hilbert, he was vague in the formulation of his problem, perhaps surprisingly vague. And this wasn't a language barrier. So, so I, I'm German. I, I read the original text in German. It got then translated into French and English. And that didn't add to the confusion. The confusion was already there in the original German language. And what type of confusion could that possibly be? Well, let's think about this for a moment. So he says, given monotromy group, given singularities, he wants us to realize it by what? Well, one way you could do it or attempt to do it is by a Fuchsian linear nth order scalar differential equation, right? Now, that's one way you could think about it, because he never uses the word matrix system. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, Hilbert uses this peculiar formulation of saying that the functions that we are, well, that he wants us to find, they can only become infinite of, you know, at most finite order at a singularity. By doing that, he actually never mentions the terminology of a Fuchsian singularity explicitly, right, which is nowadays standard terminology in ODE theory. What he actually refers to is a so-called regular singularity. And there's a big difference between these two types of singularities, as I will show you later on with example, right? So one way you could interpret it, case two, do, does he want us to look at linear systems having only regular singularities? Or because he mentions Fuchsian class, is he actually talking about honest Fuchsian systems on the whole Riemann sphere? Right? So these are three possible interpretations of his problem. And depending on which one you choose, the answer to his question is different. Right? It was already known at the time of the Congress that in case one, thinking about scalar nth order equations, the answer is negative. So he was almost certainly not going that direction. The answer is negative because Poincaré monodromy representation uh, stop, stop. which we'll talk about yeah well uh, you have to go back like 30 seconds because your picture were frozen oh oh i'm sorry what what was the last thing you heard me speaking about that Poincaré did something <laughs> something that Poincaré did something and then you got frozen Okay, let me move the computer. Maybe my internet uh, is not good. The last words were according to okay. Accord. Okay, okay, that that's that. I was pretty much there. So, case one of the interpretation of Hilbert's twenty-first uh, problem. There, the answer uh, was known to be negative already at the time when he formulated the problem because Poincaré. Prior to the Congress, he had counted the number of parameters in a Fuchsian linear scalar nth order equation and that number is strictly less than the um, dimension of the admissible monodromy representation. So that that is not what Hilbert was thinking about. Now case two, that was very influential for the, de the development of the modern theory of Riemann-Hilbert problems because Joseph Lemay, he was a Polish mathematician, in 1908 he published two papers and in those two papers, he almost solved Hilbert's 21st problem. He solved it, although only in the context of regular singularities, but he himself, I think he claimed that he had actually solved it for the Fuchsian case too, but that turned out to be wrong. Nevertheless, the almost solution of Hilbert's 21st problem for Fuchsian systems by Plémet, it was very influential because of the techniques that Plémet employed. And I will tell you those techniques later on. Anyways, I already said there was uh, a mistake in Plémet's work. He was not aware of it. He passed away in the, in the late 1950s. And in 1989, Andre Bolibruch, he came up with first counterexample for Hilbert's 21st problem in the Fuchsian interpretation. So in interpretation three up here. So the answer there, if you choose the third case, 
is just negative. So Hilbert got it wrong, right? Because he was saying it should always be possible to achieve that, but no, it's not. Okay, so now history aside, let's become a little bit more concrete. So let's introduce some background terminology. We will, it's very simple, very basic stuff. We'll be dealing with P by P linear systems of differential equations in the complex plane. So Z will always be complex. Psi is the unknown P by P matrix. A of Z is the coefficient function. I do remind you of some basic things in that theory. If you start with coefficient matrix A, which is analytic near a point Z naught, then the method of successive iterations yields existence of a fundamental solution, which is also analytic at the same point. This is the Pika-Lindelof theorem that we all know. It's actually easier to prove it, to establish it in, 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 in the complex setting, because the sequence of iterates, uh, it converges uniformly. And then if you start with something analytic, a sequence of analytic things, you have uniform convergence, the target automatically is again analytic. And, and that's not the case when you're on the real line, right? All right, however, we will be interested in differential equations with singularities. So necessarily we have to move to the Riemann sphere with n punctures. So the AJs, these are n distinct points. Um, and you uh, enforce analyticity of the coefficient matrix away from those. Then uh, you're starting with a local fundamental solution. The monodromy theorem famously guarantees that you can continue any such fundamental solution along any path on the sphere with punctures. And even better, the continuation only depends on the homotopy class of your path. All right. Now, having that under our belt, now let's move to finally define what we call monodromy. And this will turn out to be a representation of the fundamental group, as, as many of you are, of course, aware. How to do it? Well, you fix base point A0 of your um, uh, somewhere in the in, in on the surface as base point for the fundamental group, and then you start with an arbitrary fundamental solution psi, and you continue it along a loop. So pi one s a naught is just first homotopy group, and once you do this, this continuation exists by monodromy theorem. Once you have done it, you obtain another fundamental solution to the same equation, right? Call it psi tilde. But since both of these are fundamental solution to the same linear homogeneous equation, they have to be related by invertible multiplier, right? This is what is written here. The G of gamma is the invertible multiplier, depending on the loop that you choose. However, it's actually not dependent on the loop itself, because I said earlier in the monodromy theorem, it only depends on um, homotopy class. So actually what you have is a well-defined mapping from the homotopy class of such a loop to the corresponding invertible matrix G sub gamma. And this is a representation of the fundamental group, all right? Here's the picture. So the singularities I drew down there at the bottom, A1, A2, IN, the base point here on top, A0, different from all the singularities. And then the continuation is carried out along those what I will call fundamental loops. So the red loops, gamma J, the jth loop just wraps around one's uh, singularity AJ and not along not around any of the other singularities. As you can see, because of the geometry, because S is path connected, in particular, if you, um, uh, not just path connected, that's beside the point, but if you um, compose gamma one with gamma two all the way up to gamma n, then that loop, that composition loop is homotopic to the trivial loop, right? Because of the geometry of the surface. All right. Fantastic. Now, what are the monodromy matrices? Well, those are just the matrices that um, you know come from the image of the representation under the equivalence class of such a fundamental loop. We denote them by G sub I. And there's N of those because they got N singularities and they generate a group which we shall call the monodromy group. Now, up to this point, there's still some ambiguity in the game that should be clear because I said earlier, we, we start with an arbitrary fundamental solution psi, and we choose an arbitrary base point for our fundamental group. So what happens if you start with a different fundamental solution? What happens if you start with a different base point? Well, that is well known. The, the corresponding monodromy matrices where provided you start with a different choice, they are related to the original ones by conjugation with invertible matrices, right? This is here again on the level of the fundamental solution because you're looking at a homogeneous linear system. And 
when you start changing the base point because now now this is because of path connectedness the the corresponding fundamental groups they are isomorphic right and, and that isomorphism translates into the fact that the corresponding monodromy matrices they are related by uh, conjugation with invertible matrix so in other words what i'm aiming at is that you should really be thinking of monodromy as an element of this space here right so conjugacy classes of representations of the fundamental group where you quotient out the general linear group Okay, very good. Now, instead of thinking about maps, instead of thinking about representations or consciousy classes thereof, you can also think about sort of more down to earth matrices. So there's an isomorphism of this curly M up here to that thing down there. So N uh, P by P matrices, G1 up to GN, they have to satisfy what I will call cyclic constraint because uh, I said earlier the the fundamental loops, they compose to the trivial loop, they're homotopic to the trivial loop, the composition of all N of them. And that simply means that all these N matrices, they have to multiply together to the identity matrix. Um, this is perhaps a little bit easier down here because you can now count the dimension. You can very easy count because you got N matrices of you know size P by P. So you got N times P squared many parameters, but then you got this one matrix constraint. So this enforces p squared many equations. So you got n minus one times p squared um, many variables, and then you have to quotient out and then you subtract minus p squared minus one. This is a number to keep in mind, n minus two times p squared plus one. All right, one thing um, remains to be defined, Fuchsian singularities, all right? Well, uh, a system uh, is a Fuchsian system if all its singular points are first order poles. And here, without loss of generality, we shall assume that those n singular points, they all lie in the finite part of the complex plane. This you can always achieve by some Möbius map. Um, and as such, if all the singularities are in the finite part, in particular, the point at infinity is not going to be a singularity. And that is equivalent to this constraint here on the right, that the sum of the residue matrices is the zero matrix. right? So that zero is P by P matrix. Very good. Now we have everything in place to give precise formulation of the original Riemann-Hilbert problem in the Fuchsian setting. It is simply a question about whether the so-called monodromy map is subjective. So what, what is the mapping here? What's the codomain and the domain? Well, the domain we've already defined. These are This is the monodromy, right? Conjugacy classes of representations. And on the left is something which I will call M star. It's written out here. So n tuples of p by p invertible, um, not invertible, n tuples of p by p matrices, which sum up to zero, again, quotient out by general linear group. If you do the counting here once more, that thing has the same dimension as the curly M on the previous slide. So that might indicate that this is perhaps a bijection. Well, well, it's not. So this, but this took a long time. So this is Andre Bolibruch's great achievement of 1989, that although the dimensions here match in general, this map is not subjective. And I will get to that. Okay, now let's first look, however, at Pleme's almost solution to this problem. So Pleme, 1908, he published solution or he claimed it to be a solution and it was accepted by the community for many, many years you know, for almost 80 years. What he did is quite curious. So he reduced the original Riemann-Hilbert problem to a problem in the theory of integral equations. So this was very much an analytic solution or an analytic approach to the problem. He used state-of-the-art stuff. I mean, state-of-the-art meaning back in 1908. So uh, Fred Holm had developed theory of integral equations, maybe 10 years before that. Hilbert had worked a lot on singular integral equations. So Pleme came about with tools like the Fretholm alternative, Ries Schauder theorem. All of this is very standard nowadays in, in, in our classes. But back then in 1908, it, it was really state of the art stuff. All right. So what did he do? Well, what is the Hilbert boundary value problem in, in, in his work? Well, here's a picture. So you start with the n singularities. That's the data which is given to you. So you know the singularities and you know the monodromy matrices. And again, we assume all of them to be in the finite part of the plane. These are the black dots in my picture. Now, what he did is he connected them by a simple closed contour, say, you know, these straight lines here. The fundamental loops are again indicated in red. 
And then he defined on the curve gamma a piecewise constant matrix valued function. And the value um, of that function is indicated here in red. So on the segment from A2 to A1, you want that function to be equal to the first monotremy matrix G1. Then on the second one, you multiply G2 onto G1, and that's how you go all the way around. Keep in mind, the monodromy matrices, they have to satisfy a cyclic constraint. They have to multiply to the identity. And that means in turn on the last segment here, from AN to A1 or the other way around, um, you have the identity matrix as value of your, of your piecewise constant thing. Um, I've oriented the contour, as you can see. So there is the arrow. So as you traverse in the direction of the arrow, what I will use is I will say that the, the, the side to the left is the plus side and the side to the right is the minus side. And as you can see, the contour, it now partitions your complex plane into two domains. There is the, well, the exterior. This will be called C plus domain. It contains the point at infinity. And then there's the interior, which contains the base point A naught of the fundamental group. This will be called C minus. All of this is written out here, what I just said in Word. Now, what is the Hilbert boundary value problem? So here for the first time, it comes in a blue box. It asks us to determine a pair of matrix valued P by P functions, Y plus and Y minus. Y plus is meant to be analytic in the exterior region, C plus, Y minus analytic in the interior one, C minus. Besides the analyticity in those domains, you require continuity down to the contour, but away from the end singular points. Right? That's constraint number one. Constraint number two, on the line segments, away from the endpoints, you require y plus and y minus, right? So they are continuous down to the contour, but their values need not match as you come from the outside and go to the inside. What is the constraint is that those values have to be related by this constraint, the jump constraint, and that constraint precisely involves that piecewise defined thing, which is written out here in terms of the monodromy matrices, call it G of Z. Okay. One thing remains, or perhaps two, depending on how you count, you have to enforce some singular constraints near the, near, the, near the singular points. So Y plus, Y minus, depending on how you approach the singular point, is meant to stay integrable in this sense. So Y plus minus Z times Z minus AK to a power kappa strictly less than one, supposed to go to zero as Z creeps up to AK. And this is to be understood in a non-tangential fashion. So, so you, you creep up to the singular point either from the outside or from the inside, but in a non-tangential fashion. Okay. Also at infinity, you have to enforce a certain normalization. It is written out here. So Y plus, because we are outside, we're shooting off to infinity, multiplied onto by Z to the D, D being a diagonal matrix with integer um, entries is supposed to approach the identity matrix. Okay, that's a problem. This problem is equivalent to a system of singular integral equations. I don't write out those integral equations because actually problems of this type with you know three or four conditions, we will see later on again. That's why I choose this approach. Now, what did Playmay do? Well, he first proved this problem has a solution. And for that, he, he used abstract reasoning, uh, Reese Schauder theorem and, and, and Fretholm alternative. And now, how does the solution to the same problem actually relate back to the Riemann-Hilbert problem? Well, here we go. He took the solution, which exists by abstract reasoning, multiplied onto it Z minus A1, raised to that matrix D, which appeared at the normalization at infinity, and calls it Psi. And then he proved, as a simple enough calculation, the same Psi, it satisfies P by P system of differential equations. An R of Z coefficient matrix is actually rational with poles precisely at the singular points. And even better, the monodromy generated by the system uh, two, it exactly is equal to the monodromy that you come with. So the monodromy group is generated by the same matrices G1 up to Gn. So that's great because now you're almost there. But now of course the, the devil is in the detail because these poles here, 
they need not be of order one. So in other words, this system need not be in general a Fuchsian system. And, and that's where it, he went off in a, in a sense. He knew, or he realized, however, that the system is foremost a regular system. So now it's a good time to define what are regular systems versus Fuchsian systems. Well, regular system is a, is a system of the type one where all the singularities are regular. So what does this mean? Any solution of a system at such a singularity uh, has at most polynomial growth in a vicinity of it, okay? Now, is there a difference between Fuchsian singularities and regular singularities? You probably know the answer. Well, if you are in the scalar world, so P equal to one, then actually they are the same. So Fuchsian singularities for an nth order uh, scalar differential equation and regular singularities, they are exactly the same things. But this is no longer true if you go to matrix systems. Um, if you go to matrix system, simple enough, example written here, look at this guy. So this has a uh, regular singularity at z equal to zero. You can check for yourself that there's some multi-valuedness, but okay, take care of it with some branch convention. And now if you just formally differentiate this guy, you will find out it satisfies the system written up here. And there you see z equal to zero is a second order pole. So this is not a Fuchsian system. Now, Playmay, he was aware of that. He was aware that Fuchsian systems, they form a proper subclass of regular systems. But he wanted to solve Hilbert's 21st problem for the Fuchsian system. So what did he do? Well, he applied a series of transformations, explicit transformations. You can read them in his paper. And those transformations, they fix the singularities, they fix the corresponding monodromy, but they change regular singularities to Fuchsian singularities. And he falsely believed he can do that for all n of those singularities, but that's not true. And he was not aware of that thing. You can achieve it for all except perhaps one of them. But this is a theorem that, that was written down many years after he had passed away. So this is Ilyashenko Tribic in the early 80s. If you put an additional constraint in the game in that one of the monodromy matrices is diagonalizable, then actually play maze transformation trickery, it works for all the singularities. And in that scenario, Hilbert's 21st problem for Fuchsian systems has a positive solution. But if this is not the case, then unfortunately, Playmay was wrong. He was not aware of it. Nevertheless, I want to you know, formulate a positive result that came out of his work. And this is the Royal Playmay theorem. Playmay published it in 1908. I read his paper. This is in German. It's quite tough you know, to follow him. He then wrote a book in 1957, and, and this is very much from the book. So any matrix group with n generators satisfying this constraint that we saw earlier, it can be realized as monodromy group of a regular system on the sphere, having all singularities Fuchsian with at most one exception. And that is definitely a positive result that he proved rigorously already in 1908. He was wrong in claiming that he can reduce all of his singularities to Fuchsian ones, but that he didn't realize. Okay, anyway, so now let's switch uh, gears slightly. Well, let's let's move on further down the timeline, so to speak. So Playmay had published this in 1908. The community had accepted it as a positive affirmative solution to Hilbert's 21st problem for Fuchsian systems. And henceforth, the community focused on other aspects when it came to this particular problem. So they try to make things more explicit and more concrete. It started with Birkhoff. I didn't even put his name on the slide in 1913. Birkhoff simplified Playmay's argument and in particular, he generalized it to systems of difference equations. There you can ask very similar questions. By the way, Igor Kritcheva, who will be celebrated in this, in this workshop, he has written papers about monodromy of uh, systems of differential equa difference equations and, and associated Riemann-Hilbert problems. I, I will not look at difference equations. Uh, instead, what I will focus on um, um, concerns foremost uh, differential equations. So in that area, Lapo Danilevsky in 1929, he came up with an almost constructive solution to the problem. He used power series and inversions thereof, but that only works for monodromy matrices close, sufficiently close in some sense to the identity matrix. Um, 
very nice stuff, very much special function related work was done by Krylov in Erugin 56 and 83, but that concerns now two by two systems with three or four singular points. This Krylov business, it deals with Gaussian Gauss hypergeometric functions. And the, the case with four singular points is very, very nice, very interesting, because it relates to Poinlevy special function theory. So Poinlevy 6, the Hilbert 21st problem for two by two systems with four singular points, it relates to Poinlevy 6. And I mentioned this because later on Poinlevy functions will appear. Um, what else? Well, besides of making or next to making things more explicit, more concrete, of course, people started generalizing Hilbert's 21st problem, going away from the Riemann sphere to more sophisticated surfaces. All of this can be done. It requires, though, a very different approach. This is foremost geometric stuff. This was done by Reuel first in the 50s, Pierre Delin contributed prominently to this area. Nowadays, all these beautiful generalizations to, to surfaces, they go under the name of Hil Riemann-Hilbert correspondences. I will not touch upon those. Instead, I will tell you now a little bit about, well, the ultimate negative solution given by Bolibruch, further simplified by Kostov in those three years. Bolibruch's work was very, very, uh, very beautiful because he gave necessary and sufficient conditions for the solvability of Hilbert's 21st problem on the Riemann sphere. So what are some of those things? So here's the bolibruch kostov theorem, 1989. So this is, you know, 89 years after Hilbert's address. So he they proved that once you come about with irreducible monodromy representations, those guys you can realize by a Fuchsian system on the sphere. So that's positive result. But if you drop the, 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 the irreducibility, then there indeed are certain reducible monitoring representations which you cannot realize by Fuchsian systems. And Bolibruch gave an effective recipe to construct counterexamples. The first one was a four by four system with three singular points. So as it so happened, Hilbert got it wrong. I already said this earlier. The original Riemann-Hilbert problem in the Fuchsian interpretation cannot uh, uh, work out. We cannot always realize a given monodromy group by a Fuchsian system on the Riemann sphere. Very good. So now, uh, Andre Bolibruch did this in 1989. He then lectured on those results also at an international congress of mathematics, but this was 1994, so 94 years after Hilbert. He then sadly, soon after he passed away. Anyways, now, what I will do now is I will uh, follow developments tangential to Plimet's work because he used analysis in his almost solution and the techniques that he used, they actually sh uh, showed up reappearing in, in problems related to integrable system techniques, right? So, but this was in the, in the 1960s, 1970s, and now I will walk you through some of that history. That really, those problems, they gave rise to Riemann-Hilbert factorization problems and a whole toolbox around them. And then this is quite interesting stuff, I think. All right, so it starts though historically again in the 19th century. This uh, There's the famous Sommerfeld diffraction problem. This is from 1896. Sommerfeld is a problem in wave mechanics. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, Sommerfeld came up with a solution, uh, but I will use a different approach to it, an approach that really uh, requires the study of Hilbert boundary value problems. And that's Wiener Hopf method, right? So Wiener Hopf, this is in the 1930s. So here's the problem. Um, you have incoming train of plane waves indicated as orange you know, arrows, and you have an infinite barrier here on the positive x-axis, right? So that boundary constraint, you can see immediately what will happen. The waves cannot pass through it. So here on the right, you will have a region where reflection happens, and you will have a region which is always in the dark, right? Because the rays cannot pass through it. So now you come with a wave equation in two dimensions and you try to solve the associated boundary value problem. How do you do that? Well, first off, the wave equation is a so-called Helmholtz equation. It's given here. There's some wave number K naught squared involving and some boundary condition. I'm, I'm, I'm very vague about it. I don't even show you the boundary condition. All I will do about this problem is I will tell you if you use Wiener-Hopf techniques, 
you go to Fourier variables. In those Fourier variables, the PDE with the boundary condition, it will become an integral equation. And the same integral equation as an integral equation of Wiener Hopf type is equivalent to a Hilbert boundary value problem. That, that's the only thing I will say about it. I won't show you the same problem. I do this because of historical reasons. I think really this Sommerfeld diffraction problem was the first problem in mathematical physics where Hilbert boundary value problems can be used efficiently for the solution of the problem. That's why I mention it. Now I will say much more about the integrable systems revolution that took place in the 1960s and the 1970s. And again, Igor Kritschewa, he contributed famously to, to, to this area back then. So what happened? Well, there were first some numerical simulations carried out by Fermi, Pasteur, Ulam, and then Gardner, Green, Kruska, Miura developed a method, the inverse scattering transform that allows you to solve certain PDE initial value problems. Many other important people contributed to it then over the years. Peter Lacks, Vladimir Zakharov, of course, famously, discovery of complete integrability of uh, defocusing NLS. And that actually is the equation I, I will use to showcase the, the Hilbert boundary value problem. So defocusing NLS is written out here. There are many other equations, of course, where the same scheme applies, but there's no time for that. So let's focus on defocusing NLS written out here and the initial value problem. So you start with some you know, simple, uh, nice initial data from the Schwartz space, say. X is space, T is time. All right, so how do you solve this initial value problem? Well, these people, these gentlemen have showed us how to do it as a first step, which involves the calculation of the so-called reflection coefficient. Now there's not much wiggle room in this because if you start with Cauchy, data that is from the Swartz space, then there's a bijection to the class of reflection coefficients in the same function space and moreover functions or reflection coefficients with supremum norm strictly less than one. This is famous result by Beals and Koifman. It's, so, it's the so-called direct scattering transform. And only very rarely will you actually have a formula for the R of Z, right? So you come with Y naught and then you try to calculate R of Z. Only rarely you have a formula for it, but that's okay. You have very nice analytic properties for R of Z. And having those nice analytic properties, Zakharov and Shabbat then showed how you can now construct solution to the PDE initial value problem. And it goes through the inverse scattering transform, which is most conveniently formulated again as a Hilbert boundary value problem. So that's that's the third one that we now encounter, the zakharov shabat problem. It asks you to find matrix valued function X um, two by two. Uh, the characterizing properties are formulated in terms of a spectral variable Z, but because there's a PDE somewhere in the background, X and T, they enter as parameters. And then as it was for Pleme back then, you enforce certain conditions on X of Z. Analyticity somewhere in the plane away from some contour. Earlier for Pleme, it was this polygonal path joining all the singularities. Now it's simple, it's just a real line. And we again um, uh, impose continuous extension down to the real line. Then on the jump contour, as it was earlier for play may, we have some jump constraint. Here it is written. It looks perhaps a little bit more complicated, but methodologically the same thing is happening again. X plus and X minus are related by this jump constraint. And that jump constraint encodes the Cauchy data through the reflection coefficient. And it depends on the parameters T up here and X here to the right. Lastly, some normalization at infinity, exactly how it was for play may. Now, how does it relate to the uh, PDE initial value problem. Well, if that problem is solvable, which it often is, then if you look at this coefficient here, x1 at infinity, so this is an expansion in large z, meaning x1 is independent of z, but it depends parametrically on x and t, and then up to two times the imaginary unit, that same coefficient, it's one, two entry, it will solve your PDE with the given initial data. Right? So that, that, that's how it works. Okay, next example, the third one in my list. Uh, besides PDEs, there are ODEs, some of which are very important in mathematical physics. Now, in the early 1980s, a new method came about, the so-called isomonodromy method. Um, 
depend, develop more or less independently by two groups, Jimbo Miwa Bueno in Japan and Flashka New in the United States. I also mentioned the Leningrad gang around Alexander Itz, Viktor Novokshenov, Andrei Kapayev, uh, Alexander Kitayev, because they really matured the theory. And I will walk you through one of the aspects of the same theory. I will focus on a particular Van Levy equation, the second one, which is written out here. Um, it's the second one in a list, as you know, of six celebrated Quanlevé differential equations. Um, and for simplicity of the argument, I will be focusing on solutions that satisfy this additional constraint that just says that the solution is supposed to be real valued on the real axis. Okay, so how do you solve? Now, careful with this word. That's why it's in quotation marks. So, of course, u identically zero solves this thing. But there's a hard theorem that says, you know, any other non-trivial solution you cannot construct in terms of classical special functions and finite number of contour, contour integrals thereof. So, so what do I mean by solve? Well, we will rephrase Poinlevé 2 again in terms of the Hilbert boundary value problem. And here's the construction. We define Stokes data, three parameters as one, two, three that satisfy this constraint. This constraint you should um, link to the constraint that we had earlier in play maze work when all the monodromy matrices multiply to the identity matrix, right? So this constraint, you can now count a little bit. This makes this uh, generically a two-dimensional manifold. And that is okay because I'm looking at a second order differential equation. So there should be two degrees of freedom, right? Um, these last two constraints here, that S1 is the complex conjugate of S3 and S2 is real valued, they are not essential. They are here because I'm looking at these solutions which are real valued on the real axis, right? And in fact, if you have this constraint here, these additional two constraints in place, this guy here is generically a two-dimensional real manifold, okay? All right, excellent. Now, coming with this data, this is our monodromy data, our Stokes data. We define two by two matrices, the Stokes matrices. They are lower and upper triangular. There are six of those, uh, but you know I have only like uh, two parameters. Well, so that there's some relation uh, enforced with those. So they are lower upper triangular depending on your index. And then again, you look at a particular Hilbert boundary value problem. I write it here as the Poinlevé 2 problem. It again asks you to find something matrix valued uh, the characterizing property are written out in terms of a spectral variable, but since there's an ODE this time in the background, there will be parameter X somewhere. Problem is written out here. We don't need to bother ourselves with the technicalities now anymore. You can clearly see that the same methodology applies that we had earlier for the defocusing NLS and pre uh, previously for Plemais' solution of Hilbert's 21st problem. Analyticity somewhere away from a contour, here is those six rays. Continuous extension in the sectors in between, jump relation on the rays and normalization somewhere. That, that's the only thing you should take from this. The precise structure here doesn't matter, right? What matters is a result by Bolibruch and Kapayev and Itz that for admissible choices of Stokes data, this problem is meromorphically with respect to solvable, and here is Poinlevé 2 solution hidden. So again, you look at that x1 coefficient at infinity. It's independent of z, but it depends on the parameter x, and it also depends on the Stokes data s that we start with. That coefficient, it's one, two entry up to a factor of two. It will solve your second Poinlevé equation. Okay, This is not a coincidence, not at all because there's a second part to this result that in fact any solution to the second Poinlevé equation can be characterized in this fresh in this fashion. So there's a bijection between solutions of Poinlevé 2 and that monodromy manifold M. So in, in other words, this bijection allows you to parametrize solutions to Poinlevé 2 in terms of monodromy data. And this is very convenient to do, especially for application. Okay, next application. More in math physics, quantum integrable systems. Um, you know, there's this famous JMMS paper of 1981. Bogolyubov, Izergin, Korepin wrote a book. Uh, Alexander Itz, also a major player back then. I will just focus on one example. I'm not attempting here to give lecture on quantum integrable systems. Uh, one example is a, is a 
uh, Heisenberg anti-ferromagnetic model, the spin one half XY model. There is a Hamiltonian on a suitable Hilbert space with Pauli matrices. We don't need to know the details. I'm advertising here Hilbert boundary value problems. So where do they enter in the study of this model? That That's more the question I would like to answer. Well, this is an exactly solvable integrable model. You can calculate certain correlation functions, one of which is the so-called autocorrelation function. And that guy admits a Fretholm determinant representation. This is the formula written out here. So DET is a Fretholm determinant of an integral operator, K sub T, on this space. And the kernel of K of T is written out here on the right. Now, Fretholm determinants in general are highly complicated objects. They're highly transcendental functions, say, as a function of T. So how do you actually calculate them efficiently? Well, as it happens, you can recast the Fretholm determinant in terms of a Hilbert boundary value problem. And here it is. Again, the details, they don't matter much. It's the same methodology that applies. Analyticity of a function somewhere on the contour, some jump constraint, and normalization at singular points and at the point infinity. Provided this guy is solvable, provided such a function x of z exists, then it relates back to the Fraton determinant with this simple enough formula. So you take the logarithmic derivative of the Fraton determinant, this is a function of t, t positive, then up to minus two, this is precisely the one one entry of this x one coefficient. Right? So then this is good. This is good. Well, well, okay, why is it good? It might not be so clear because I'm rephrasing right now, I'm paraphrasing an object which is highly transcendental in terms of a solution of a problem. And it's not so clear how explicit the solution of this problem actually is. But but I will get to that later. Okay. Last one, fifth example that I've prepared. This pertains to uh, the theory of random matrices. There are some exactly solvable matrix models out there. Um, here is one, so n by n Hermitian matrices, and you sample them according to some probability measure, written out here. So what, what are the players? So m is your n by n Hermitian matrix, dm is just the product Lebesgue measure on the functionally independent entries of m, and then there's some Boltzmann-Gibbs weight here. So e to the minus capital N, N is another parameter. You could set it equal to the, to the size. And then there's a confining potential V. For simplicity, as a first exposition, you can think of V of X equal to X squared. That, that will already be very nice. C is normalization, so that you have probability measure. Now, the, the, the study of such objects is, is, is you know, very traditional, I would say. Um, physicists in the 1970s realized Dyson Godard meta that you can calculate various important statistical quantities in this model in terms of orthogonal polynomials. For instance, correlation functions you can calculate in terms of the Christoffel Dabu kernel of a system of orthogonal polynomials. So here's the Christoffel Dabu kernel written out. The polynomials are the P sub J's. They are orthonormal even with respect to this e to the minus n v of x. Remember, v of x is our confining potential. All right. Now, however, now comes the, the issue. So unless your v of x is very simple, for instance, v of x equal to x squared is simple, uh, if that's not the case, then you don't have any good formulas for your orthogonal polynomials. Good meaning here formulas that allow me to carry out some efficient asymptotic analysis, right? Because ultimately, you're interested in scaling limits of your correlation kernel. So what do you do if you don't have those formulas? Well, as it so happens, there is a way to characterize those orthogonal polynomials, again, through a Hilbert boundary value problem. Fokas Itzkitaev showed how to do that in the early 90s. Once more, need to find some matrix valued function, analytic properties somewhere, jump on a contour and normalization at some points. That's it. If this problem is solvable, this by the way happens precisely when those polynomials exist, then the solution that matrix function X of Z, if you look at its one one entry, that will give you the nth monic orthogonal polynomial with respect to this weight. Okay, so those were five examples now. But I already indicated, I haven't really made a strong point why the Hilbert boundary value problem characterization would be any better 
than what I start with, right? So for instance, if you think about this, uh, this, this, this spin chain model, frat home determinant, which is complicated object, I rephrased in terms of solution of Hilbert boundary value problem. Yeah, but as it so happens, you're not able to write down explicit formula for that boundary value problem. So what have I actually achieved by this characterization, right? So I would now like to answer the question, so what? Well, that takes us back to Pleme. So we come full circle. You can think, and many people do it, you can think of Hilbert boundary value problems as types of contour integral representations for your observables. And this really goes back to Pleme, because what did Pleme do? Well, he came about with a Hilbert boundary value problem, having its solution abstractly, he then showed it relates to a system of differential equations. So in other words, if you can link your observable to a Hilbert boundary value problem, then you are in a position to derive systematically dynamical systems for your observables. Pleme did it first in 1908, I mentioned Alexander Ritz in 1990 because he really stressed that point for the quantum integrable systems. Okay, But what else? Well, I mean, this is in complete analogy. That's why I use contour integral terminology here, because if you have a function as a contour integral, then it's easy to differentiate the guy. right? And, and here, this very similar thing happens, but on the level of the Hilbert boundary value problem. Now, what else? Well, contour integrals, they are amenable to asymptotic analysis. Right? There's classical stuff out there. Many books have been written about it. Well, it would be great if similar techniques exist for Hilbert boundary value problems, and, and they do. This took you know 40 years or so to, to transpire. It started with Sergei Manakov, also uh, uh, Mark Aplowitz. They worked on the integral equations. These are Gelfand-Levitan type equations. The first people who seemingly work directly on the level of the Hilbert boundary value problems are again Itz, Novokshenov, Kapayev, and Kitayev. They used, however, WKB techniques for the asymptotic study of the Riemann Hilbert problem. Um, and those WKB techniques, oftentimes, they require you to come with some a priori information about the asymptotics that you're trying to establish. And that's quite hard then to rigorously justify that a priori step. Fortunately, Percy Dave and Jin Zhou in 1993 came up with a more or oh, with a better approach. It's nowadays called the nonlinear steepest descent method. That method goes through without any a priori information. And that is the nowadays go-to method, the Dave Joe nonlinear steepest descent method. It's the go-to method if you're interested in pulling asymptotics out of a Hilbert boundary value problem. And I will show you three uh, examples where this method has been successfully applied and what kind of results came out of it. Well, the first one takes us back to Poinlevé functions. They are the famous connection problems. They already exist for, for classical, you know, differential equations, linear ones. So what have I what do I have in mind? Well, we pick a particular solution family to Point Levé 2. Point Levé 2 I showed you earlier. I parametrize solutions of it in terms of the Stokes data. And here I make this particular choice. All right, that's a choice. That choice, in fact, corresponds to the aplowitz segur family of solutions that was studied in the early 1980s. Now, it's not hard to figure out, for that you don't need your Hilbert boundary value problem, it's not hard to figure out that solution to Poinlevé 2 with that data behaves at plus infinity very much like Airy function. So it goes down to zero super exponentially fast, but it is multiplied by that parameter gamma. Right and and gamma is is non-negative real numbers. Say you can make this complex too, but here let's keep it simple. Let's keep, make it non-negative. Now, so you know now how your solution behaves in one direction, and you know how it depends on the parameters. So now the connection problem asks you to construct asymptotics in a different direction and figure out how the parameters in that direction relate back to this gamma. So that's that's connection problem. And the answer is known for aplowitz segur family, and it's a very rich answer. There are three qualitatively different cases. There is a case, gamma strictly less than one, non-negative, where you have oscillations out at minus infinity on the real line. 
decaying amplitudes. This should remind you of Airy equation. I said earlier, you can think about Poinlevé 2 as a nonlinear Airy equation. And the Airy function, it oscillates out at minus infinity. But this is nonlinear version thereof, because in the Airy function asymptotics at minus infinity, you don't have ln of, of you know, minus x. Right? That's the first case, bounded oscillatory behavior. Once you move gamma into one, it changes dramatically. It becomes unbounded algebraic to leading order. This is the hastings McLeod behavior at minus infinity. And then lastly, if you exceed gamma equal to one, then you leave the realm of physical solutions because the solutions, they start blowing up at finite negative x. And then this translates into some singular asymptotics. These three olive boxes, I, I didn't mention the people who contributed to all of this. This was quite a long, rich story. Um, it took perhaps 20 years or so until finally all those formulas were pinned down precisely. Um, here is now the point where this is the only time where I mention actually one of my own results in this area. So these three boxes, they clearly indicate that, you know, gamma equal to one, there's a phase transition. So, and in particular, the asymptotics at minus infinity are not uniform around gamma equal to one. But actually, you can do better. You can uniformize these asymptotics by using Hilbert boundary value problems and techniques, therefore, by uh, using also Jacobi elliptic functions. I did this myself several years ago, but that that's it all right now second thing is sort of the birth of integrable probability uh solution to ulam's problem that is the the, the stuff about longest increasing subsequences so you start with a shuffle of n objects you define increasing subsequences so uh those are the ones that um, uh, respect the order of this starting k tuple and then you look for the length of the longest increasing subsequence. So here's a concrete example. You look at shuffle of five natural numbers. It has a bunch of increasing subsequences. Here are ones of length two. There's two of length three, but that's it. So the length of the longest increasing subsequence for that shuffle is equal to three. All right, but that's all deterministic. So now what you do is you pick your permutation at random, uniformly distributed. And then L of N becomes random variable. So what can you say about its large N asymptotics? Well, many people, con Ulam, this I think it was 50s or early 60s, many people then contributed to this area. I only mentioned three of them because they gave the final answer. So Bike Dive Johansson, the famous theorem of 1999. Um, you take L of N, you center it, you scale, and then uh, as N tends to infinity, that uh, random variable has a limiting distribution. This is one of the so-called tracy Witham distributions, and the same can be written. Its distribution function can be written in terms of solution of Poinlevy 2 equation. So this U is one of the guys we encountered earlier. This is hastings McLeod solution. Now, to prove this thing, nowadays, by my count, there are at least two books written about this beautiful theorem. Um, and 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 you know, content surrounding it. You need more than just a Hilbert boundary value problem. It's a beautiful combination of various arguments, some of which are written out here. But lastly, you need to analyze orthogonal polynomials. And I showed you earlier that there are Hilbert boundary value problems which allow you to do that. And then what the guys did is they derived asymptotics of that Hilbert boundary value problem and out came formula here on the variable. Okay, very good. Last thing, and then I'm almost done. Um, universality for invariant random matrix models, perhaps the most prominent use of asymptotics for Hilbert boundary value problems. So we had earlier this matrix model, invariant model. I said for simplicity, you can think about V of X equal to X squared. Um, but there's more to it. Uh, the, 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 the microscopic scaling limits that come out for your correlation kernel, they are to a large extent independent of the particular choice of potentials. And that is the universality. So it starts by establishing first limits for the Christoffel Dabu kernel on the diagonal. So that's just the mean eigenvalue density, this object. Uh, you can take n equal to capital N for simplicity. And then this thing has a limiting density, rho of V, which is incidentally the equilibrium measure density. So if you come with a nice enough potential, you can ensure that this density is supported on a compact interval on the real line. 
All right, let's think about this case, that that's more than enough. And now what you want to do is you want to pick different, qualitatively different points on that one interval and study scaling limits, microscopic scaling limits of your correlation curve. And that has been done. Outcomes, the bulk universality, this is around points where the limiting density is strictly positive. It's given by the sine kernel, famous sine kernel. This was first established by Leonid Pasteur, by the way, and Maria Sherbina, 1997. This was not via Riemann-Hilbert techniques. Blecher, Itz, and Dave and friends, those were Riemann-Hilbert techniques. Now, because it's one interval, there could be points where it goes down to zero. That happens at the end points. There, the scaling behavior is different, outcomes a different kernel, which is the area kernel. All right, I, I will leave it at that. Uh, in fact, wrapping it up. So what I did is I walked you first through some historical excursion, making a point that Hilbert's 21st problem, so here's Hilbert on the right and Riemann on the left, These that problem should be called the original Riemann-Hilbert problem. Then I walked you through Joseph Plemais, the gentleman here at the bottom, his contributions, he came up with an almost solution. You know, to be absolutely honest, he got it wrong. He claimed he had solved it, but no, he didn't. But the techniques that he came up, that he used with, those became very influential later on in applications to integrable systems theory. I showed you five examples, all of which are underwritten by a particular Hilbert boundary value problem. And then in the last part, I made the case that you know, although it might seem abstract, these Hilbert boundary value problems are really very useful because they allow you to derive dynamical systems and in particular asymptotics for the observables that, that you are after. Right, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks. Uh, I should start with apologize. I introduced our speaker wrong. It's Thomas Oatner, right? Oh, that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> now you're in England. Uh, you're my, you might be used to uh, having your name wrongly pronounced. Uh, any questions? So uh, could you turn to page 12 of your slides? Four? Uh, page 12. 12, OK. Yeah. So the equation you wrote, wrote down here has a uh, has a irregular singularity at zero, and the yeah. solution has a uh, uh, has a uh, uh, only regular regular singularity. Can uh, is it possible, or is, uh, are there any other examples so that uh, I can even get rid of this branch point at uh, zero? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, in this example, the branch point. It, I mean, uh, zero is still a branch point. Can I cook up like is there any example that uh, I don't even have this branch point? Yeah, so the, the thing was what Pleme wanted to do is he wanted to come with, and he did come with transformations that do not change the singularity and do not change the monodromy, right? right? So right. I'm not saying you can come here, you could come with a transformation that changes this, sure, but that's not what he wanted to do, right? He wanted to fix that data. Right, I'm asking a different uh, question. So I'm just yeah. asking, like, uh, is there uh, an example that uh, that uh, has the equation sure. is kind of singularity, but there so yeah. it doesn't have like a, even have a branch point there. Yeah, I, I mean, sure. If you if you allow some you know transformations, I'm sure you can achieve that. Yes, but again, it 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 is not it is not what Pleme set out to do. And, okay. and if you're interested in, in, in solution to Hilbert's problem, you should not be doing that, right? Because you destroy then something that you already know, right? You want to have the monotomy and the singularity there. So you don't want to change that information. Okay. Okay. And uh, can you turn to page 16? 16, yes. Yeah. So, uh... yeah. Yeah. So in this problem, you're, uh, I mean, you're, uh... You know, there's a uh, singularity focus on just uh, like the positive part of this uh, uh, real yeah. line. Is yeah. there, uh, for this type of uh, problems, is there an integral formula for, for the solution? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's an integral equation underlying this, which you can solve. Yeah, this is a good point that you make. And the, the Sommerfeld diffraction problem is one of the very few cases where you can 
explicitly solve the Hilbert boundary value problem with a contour integral formula. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, is there a good reference that I can find that that oh. you could recommend that I can? Uh, well, there there's there there are books. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the titles from the top of my head. But if you write me email, I, I will point you to oh, okay. to, to, okay. to those okay. books. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. Any further questions? Could you say a few words um, about the Hilbert boundary problem associated to the system both have regular or in the irregular similar points? Oh, uh, um, yeah. So this pertains to this blue box here. Um, so how to draw the contours and how to give the jump jump functions and in that case. Um, how this comes about, that's what you're asking, yes. Um, so I I wrote a, a review. This is a, it's a longer answer, I'm, I'm afraid, or you know, that's just how it is. Um, I wrote a review paper, nonlinearity about Riemann Hilbert problems, where I walked the reader precisely through the steps how this blue problem here comes about. Um, and th this gives you some idea why the contours should be chosen in such a way, why the the, the jump matrix. I mean, so, so okay, let's, ex let's accept the contour choice for a moment. So the jump matrix, why it should be look like this, this is because, you know, of the monodromy definition, right? You want to continue your solution along, say, this loop here, and then the solution should change by what? Well, by matrix G2, right? Because that's the monotomy that you enforce about that singular singularity. And, and that's uh, that gives you an indication why, you know, from one segment to the other one, another one of those G sub Js appears, right? That is because of the monotomy that, that you enforce in the game. Now, so, so that should perhaps clarify this particular choice up here. Now, why the singular constraint at the blow-up point that, that you have to look at my paper? It, it is worked out there. So this... Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, is there more questions? So if that's not the case, let's thank the speaker again. Many thanks. Thank you very time. much.